I'd been teaching in the classroom for 30 years. I have always enjoyed that, uh, but I was burning out. Uh, my practice had been to try to change my hat every five or 10 years just to keep interested in the game. So I'd, I'd spent a few years as the head of the department. I'd spent a few years basically doing research with some colleagues, all the while teaching, teaching, teaching. But when this Internet Academy thing came along and the SUNY Learning Network was in infancy and Eric Fredrickson came to our college and said, you know, there's this thing called the Internet and we're trying to figure out a way to use it to help students learn. At that time, I happened to be doing two-way video with high schools and I said, you know, that's the, like the next level of, of absentee teaching and I can get out of the classroom a little bit if I try this. So I tried it and uh, it turned out that it was opening my eyes to this new possibility that students can really learn uh, in an environment where I'm not in charge of it altogether, that they're, they're in charge of it. So I became very interested in it. And honestly, I went to the president of the college and I said, you know, I think this is an opportunity for the college to attract new students. And he said, well, I'm gonna give you a year and you do what you can do, and if you're successful, then we'll get into it in a bigger way. And so I did, I, I got some faculty members together who agreed to do it, and it was successful, and they got excited about it, and it just sort of mushroomed from there on. The rest is history. I started in 1997 with the Empire State Partnerships Project. So we did faculty development online. We were one of three statewide projects that uh, BBN GTE Regional Technology Labs was um, conducting to see how people would use the uh, web for education. So we did an arts and integration um, uh, statewide project with NISCA, NIFA, State Ed, Monroe, and BOCES um, with a big one of those federal grants that was at the 21st Century Grants. So it was um, new web, very primitive. Um, I had an interesting uh, situation happen. I was doing a presentation at Hudson Valley on Wednesday on gamification and badging. And the faculty member that I was working with had questions we were sharing a Google Doc. So it's 11 o'clock at night, I'm in bed, and I'm on my phone editing a Google slide presentation with a faculty member. I don't know why we're both up at that hour. And I suddenly had a flashback to 1997 on a landline, in bed, in Troy, talking to someone in Buffalo about, no, no, you can't open the web browser and Word with that little memory. So open it up, get that on your clipboard, you know, and like talking someone through the screen that I was imagining in my head um, because it wasn't enough memory for them to actually compose something and keep that window open while they're copying and pasting it into the web discussion board. You know, it was, it, that's a huge, in 10 years, I mean, that's huge, that right now I'm on my phone making a presentation. There were technical problems. We were in modems, wideband was rare. Uh, not very many students had personal computers at that time. There, were, there weren't smartphones <laughs> to use. iPads had not been invented yet. So the technical issues were availability and accessibility to the technology, the basic equipment needed to study online. Also, there was a lot of skepticism about its effectiveness. Uh, a lot of, you know, the, let's just, of the stereotype, the, the English or the philosophy professor says, students can't learn this way. They need the wisdom of the scholar to guide them through this material. And it's not gonna work on the internet. So there was that skepticism. But what combated the skepticism was the success of those who tried it. And uh, at one point, there was a union issue. This is gonna put teachers out of work, you know, and the head of our union said, we've got to fight against this. And I said, well, before you fight against it, why don't you try it? So I had the head of the union teach an online course, and it was very successful. And it showed that, no, this is gonna open up employment opportunities, not restrict them. And uh, that has become, uh, at my college, uh, we used to look for teachers for online courses and now we have to turn away those who are requesting because we have all that we need. So it's become a, a real part of our, our culture to teach online. Faculty perceptions in online learning have really changed a lot over the last 15 years. 
we used to have when we first started out, it's there, there was a lot of concern over, can I do the same sorts of things? Can, can I really make students learn? Can I really measure what they're doing? And I think now there's, there's less of a focus on can we and more of a focus on how do we? So I think it really is starting to become accepted by faculty a little bit more. And as more faculty do web enhanced things and as uh, the learning management system and for good or bad publisher uh, sites and tools become more widely accepted and more readily available to faculty, I think it, it is becoming less of a is it even possible sort of idea to more of a you know it's okay how do i actually make this work nuts and bolts you know it's what is my what is my routine going to look like well i've seen it change from sort of an emerging field that was really doing pretty much the same thing that was happening face to face to a field that's uh, more interesting and more more concerned with actually getting students active we've seen more use of group projects and more interaction peer-to-peer -peer interaction uh, we've seen better designed courses, and we've seen <clears throat> the public acceptance of online learning grow as well. So it used to be that people doubted whether subject X could be taught online, and now it's pretty clear that you can teach anything face-to-face, -face, anything online that you could teach face-to-face, -face, and that the qualities with adult learners, at least it's been proven, is at least as good. So we've seen a growing acceptance and therefore more and more faculty moving into it. In all the time that I've been teaching since 2000, a lot has changed. Um, we didn't have any textbook companies that were interested in providing content. And now um, the textbook companies feel that they can provide a whole course for you. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I'm sure I don't agree with that, actually. Let me be quite honest about that. I don't believe they can, but um, that's a challenge for instructional designers working with faculty um, that we didn't have in the beginning. Every, all content was yours. The number of um, tools out there on the web that you can drag into your class now, that you can send students out to, have in, increased you know, a hundredfold. There's so much more out there um, for faculty to use. Um, just, uh, you know, acceptance of online learning as a, a thing you can actually do and that's valid has grown quite a bit. Um, administrators at colleges were not interested in it except as possibly, you know, revenue generating. <clears throat> and um, a lot of faculty we're very resistant to it. There are still pockets of that, but most people understand that it is valid um, as a way of learning and that it can be a, a big part of a student's educational experience now. We started online in 1997 and one of our main challenges was to convince both faculty and administration that online was legitimate and that it could be as good as the classroom. In the decade that followed, it became clear that in some ways online was as good as or better than classroom learning activities. And so now most administrators that I have come into contact with have come around to that belief that you know, properly designed courses work whether the environment is face-to-face -face or online or some combination of the two. So it's not so much that one approach or the other is better, it's that they're both good if they're done properly. People say that 70,000 years ago, we had this change somehow where we started being able to communicate and remember amongst 50 people, maybe 150 people. And that's where the sapiens started to really come on. When you look at recorded history, and you look at somebody like Julius Caesar, or Cicero, you know, 2,000 years ago in the Roman Republic. When they wanted to go and learn something, they went looking for a mentor. And in this case, is Apollonius on the island of Rhodes is one guy they go to go see. Because that relationship between somebody who was really great at something and them was what they were looking for, a way they could find one person to share with. And we're talking about a really small scale of learning, a couple of people who are recognized as masters 
uh, and we look historically at the sort of learning people, they're all like that, right? Like Confucius, right? We've got these single people who are masters that we learn from. But we don't have a lot of records. Like nobody knows what Apollonia said to Cicero or Caesar. We don't know, right? But we do have some of them. And when you look forward about 1,500 years, when Aristotle gets redis rediscovered in the West, we have a record of what that great person said, but no interaction. So then learning, instead of being something to a very, very small few with one expert, becomes the study of an expert from really far away. And there's a real change there in terms of what learning looks like. So instead of it being an engaged, sort of fluid, complex discussion, it becomes everybody studying one thing. And in that particular case, in the Aristotle rediscovery case, it's listening. So there's one guy at the front of the room who's got an incredibly precious record of what Aristotle said, and he chants it out to people. And people are, the only way they're going to leave the room with it is to put it in their heads and remember it. So learning, in that case, becomes a memorization process, and it becomes sort of a, an interrogation from far away, right? So you're looking into Aristotle, but he's not there to talk about it. And this is the thing that Socrates said, right? As soon as you write something down, it can't defend itself anymore. You change the process of knowledge exchange. When we go forward another couple hundred years, we start talking about a guy like Pestalozzi, who is my personal educational hero who wanted to teach an entire country how to read. So you can't do that with a text from Aristotle. You can't just hand Aristotle out to people. And you can't send one guy all the way around to teach people this stuff. So what he did is he tried to take the process of learning and basic arithmetic and, uh, pardon me, reading and basic arithmetic and writing, and he tried to codify it so that anybody who could do the barest amount of reading could walk someone else through the process atomize it to the tiniest little bits. And he's famous for saying, uh, maybe not famous enough for saying, that a textbook is only good whenever its teacher is simply a machine that the book is using, right? So that teaching is just a process of flipping pages, something that some of us still recognize today, right? But at that time, the technology available to him, what was possible to him and in his specific goal, which was trying to get a whole country to read the country of Switzerland. It was the best approach possible. But then learning is not interrogating a text. It's not talking to a mentor. It's following a step-by-step -step process set up by somebody or a group of somebody's from far away with somebody else in front of you who may not even understand what's there walking you through that process. And you can see us stepping further and further away from the human that had this knowledge to begin with. One of the great things that's happened now is that all of a sudden that connection can come back. So for those of us, I mean, digital divide aside, there's some really important issues around people having access to the internet and <clears throat> having the basic literacies to be able to use it. But for though there's still a vastly larger number of people who have access to some of this stuff and then also have access to real people again. So instead of having to plan for a textbook six months ahead of time and scrape it all together and cut down trees, whatever we need to do, at a given time, somebody can reach out and find something out. And I mean, in, in 10 years, we've already forgotten that life wasn't always like this, that I could reach up and grab my phone and find out that, you know, when the Boxer Rebellion was because I always forget. I know it's in China, but where and when I always forget, but beep, 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 and it comes up, and we've forgotten that that wasn't possible. But our education system is still designed for when it wasn't, right? Because so much of what we do is collect content and hand it to people. And when I look at, you know, and again, this, I come from both ends here. I got the open learning stuff and all the crazy stuff that I do online, and then I have the responsibilities I have at the university. And when I talk to people about the labor market and they say, well, we need people who are ready to do jobs. And I say, okay, so you're saying that in order for that to happen, you would like me to turn the university into the college from 20 years ago and pump out people who have jobs. Yet, at the same time, equivalent research is saying that they want creativity, they want communication skills, and they want these things. And none of these things say they want accountants. Not that we don't want accountants. Accountants are lovely people. 
But what they want are those skills that Caesar went to Molin for, right? That ability to convince the Senate that you should totally let me go to Gaul for five years and do all kinds of crazy things there, even though you know it's a bad idea, right? And those skills, those soft skills, we can still do that. And we can do it in ways now sort of on the fly and sort of, I have a great professor at my university. I was talking to her yesterday and we've been talking on and on for the last year and a half. And I, I wrote her a blog post about a year ago, essentially saying, you can give up your curriculum. All you need is a syllabus. If you have a syllabus and then you let the students build that curriculum, she teaches a perfect, it's a perfect course for it. She has case studies in marketing. So she sends out a challenge to the students. They go and gather from all over the web and then they do that online and then when they come back to class, all they, she does, she doesn't actually go through the content, she goes through the meta conversation. Why did you pick that? Did you see this piece when you gathered that piece of information? Oh wow, you put those two pieces together. That's really crafty. Because those are the actual literacies that those students need. They don't need to remember the name of that marketing approach or the whatever, anything that you would test on a multiple choice test. They need all of these surrounding skills, all that stuff that, that the labor market is saying they want, that can't be taught from a textbook, that can't be learned by rote, that's not about a step-by-step -step process. Because whereas to scale that basics learning that they were talking about having happen in Switzerland, that textbook approach is a really pragmatic one for doing that, for simple processes. If you want to scale complexity, every one of those students who walks in the door is coming in in a different place. And we're not trying to put them in a box. We're trying to get them from that place to a better place for them. And those paths aren't going to be the same. And I think that if we can look at the availability of those connections, in a lot of cases those connections are still text. Some cases those connections are still people, are actually people. And the availability of, well, the similarity of that world to the world that they'll get when they get out into the real world, so-called, then what we're teaching them to do is we're teaching them that soft expertise, we're giving them that experience of going through the process of becoming embedded in a world of knowing, whether that's about philosophy or whether that's about marketing or whatever it is, in a way that's gonna be far more similar to whatever it is they wanna to do to achieve. I don't care if they're artists or whatever it is, but it becomes far more similar and it answers the labor market issue in terms of the soft skills and then we need to push back on this other thing, which is really an anachronistic request to solve this problem with 20-year-old skills. So to me, when you take that historical view, when you look at that, that sort of connection, that mentorship connection, you look at what happens when print comes in and how we start to, to revere it, you look at the way that developed to the textbook and how we got a road approach to learning for practical reasons at the time, but then what we can do now if we can look at that what we do now in light of the challenges that are facing higher ed, I think we end up with a, a far more valuable experience for students that come in and we have much better arguments for why higher ed matters. And that really at the end of the day is what's important to me is that I think that us coming together with the young people in our culture and saying, you know, you can think better than you do now is really important. But if we live in a world right now that's making very Randian like numbers-based arguments for why we should have a university, if we can't count the salary they're getting six months after, if we're making those arguments, if those, that's the world that we live in and we need really coherent arguments for why that approach is anachronistic. And I think the historical thing does a really good job of that.